This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Kim Cherney, Kansas FSA Regional Farm Loan Specialist, starts the show with information about the Farm Service Agency's Farm Storage Facility Loan. She also mentions the Discrimination Financial Assistance Program. Continuing today's show is K-State canola breeder Mike Stom and Schooler's Production Origination Manager Jordan Flynn to discuss upcoming meetings about canola in Oklahoma and Kansas. K-State's Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts complete today's show evaluating timing of calving season. Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Dustin Pendle are the experts on this week's segment. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Wednesday show this week with a program information from the Farm Service Agency. And this week, we're joined by Kansas FSA Regional Farm Loan Specialist, Kim Cherney. Kim, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So today, we wanted to talk about a loan program for grain storage. And so could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I'd be happy to. FSA does administer a loan program specifically for grain storage, which is our Farm Storage Facility, or FSFL, program. This program is intended to be used by producers to help them store, handle, and or transport eligible commodities that they produce. Most commonly, this program is used for storage structures, such as grain bins and grain distribution systems. In addition, the program can also be used for the following purposes. You could use it to put up hay storage structures, bulk tanks for milk storage, cold storage for meat, eggs, fruits and vegetables, and portable equipment used to handle those eligible commodities. And that equipment can include augers, grain carts, hay wagons, baggers and unloaders, and handling trucks and trailers, which can include semi-trucks, grain trucks, and semi-trailers, such as grain hoppers. Typically, FSFL funds are utilized to purchase and or construct new bins and equipment. However, Funds can be utilized to purchase used equipment and storage facilities, but those loans do have a shorter term limit when compared to the purchase of the new items. It is a loan program specifically kind of targeted toward grain storage, but really has a wider span than just grain bins maybe in your front yard. Yes, uh, most definitely. We have a a lot of guys that have used it to purchase augers. Um, I've worked with some people that are doing cold storage for fruits and vegetables and flowers, actually. You can use it for, like they said, we said earlier, semi cabs and grain hoppers. Um, we even had one producer utilize it to help with um, egg handling and preparation for getting everything ready to put in the egg cartons. Sounds like a wide variety there of products and that producers could possibly use. Who is eligible to actually use this program? The first thing to think about is that the commodity your producer wants to store must be an eligible commodity. And luckily for us, eligible commodities include hay and most grains commonly raised in our state, such as wheat, corn, soybeans, and milo. And other eligible commodities do include fruits and vegetables, meat, eggs, and milk. The individual or entity applying must be the producer of the commodity. This product is not authorized for commercial storage. FSA does complete a storage calculation to verify that the applicant shows a need for the storage based on production acres reported to their local FSA offices. For grain storage, we can consider the applicant's storage needs for two years of production. However, for cold storage, which once again does include fruits, vegetables, meats, etc., it is limited to one year of storage needs. And so for producers who are eligible and think, oh, this might be something for them, what are some financial requirements for them when applying for this loan? Most FSA loan programs have a requirement that applicants are not able to obtain the needed credit from their commercial lender. However, that is not a requirement for the FSFL program. We can make an FSFL to an applicant that has resources necessary to obtain the loan from their commercial lender. However, we do require a financial review, and we do review the applicant's current balance sheet as well as entity members' balance sheets to verify that they are able to make the required down payment. We also do look at a typical year cash flow projection to ensure that the applicants can make the annual payments on the loan in addition to any existing loan payments and farm and non-farm expenses that they may have. It sounds like you're taking a lot of time and maybe need to have your paperwork and your whole thought process put through before applying for this loan. But what are some of the terms of the FSFL loan? 
the maximum term, which is the length of the loan, corresponds with the loan amount. So loan terms can be anywhere from three, five, seven, 10, or 12 years. And those are tied to the amount of the loan request. So each FSFL loan has a maximum amount of $500,000. However, you can apply for multiple loans, providing that you show the storage needs and repayment ability. Applicants are required to make a 15% down payment of the total cost of the structure or equipment. There is possibilities for slightly lower down payments on smaller loans of $50,000 or less, which do fall under our microloan program. The interest rates are established each month for this program. The interest rate for each loan is the rate in effect at the time of loan approval and is fixed for the life of the loan. Interest rates have increased from lows a few years ago, but are still very reasonable. For example, for a loan approved in July, a three-year term carries an interest rate of four and an eighth percent, where a 12-year term carries an interest rate of three and three quarters percent. And you mentioned microloan, which the FSA program has many loans there to help producers kind of get going, but also maybe help them expand. However, specifically looking at this FSFL loan, what is some security that's required to obtain it? The security that we require depends upon the aggregate outstanding loan amount. So in other words, we take into account any outstanding FSFL loans that you have currently in addition to the new loan that you are applying for. So for aggregate amounts of $100,000 or less, a first lien is required just on whatever is being purchased with that facility loan. So if you are just purchasing a grain trailer, we will put a lien just on that grain trailer. However, if for larger loans with aggregate amounts of over $100,000, a lien or mortgage on attractive real estate is required in addition to the lien being taken on whatever is being purchased with those loan funds. Ideally, we prefer that the real estate be the underlying real estate where the structure is being constructed, but any real estate uh, that they're willing to offer will take. And as an alternative to a lien on the structure and or a lien on real estate, we do offer the option that, that the applicants can provide what is called an irrevocable letter of credit that would come from their lending institution. And this document would satisfy the security requirement and not require us to put a mortgage on any of their properties. Continuing to talk about the financial aspect of this loan, is there a fee that producers must pay to apply? There is. There is a non-refundable application fee of $100 that is charged for each FSFL application. And also, if the loan were happen to be secured by real estate, the applicant would be required to pay for an appraisal if that is needed and all costs associated with title work, mortgage filings, and things like that. So if someone is thinking, man, this loan sounds like a loan for me and what I'm hoping to do in my future, what do they need to do to get started? So Kansas does handle our program a little differently than a lot of states because we have a regionalized delivery system. We have four offices in the state that are primarily responsible for administering this program. For those of you who may be interested, I would recommend that you contact your local FSA office and the staff there will be able to put you in touch with the regional offices. So kind of a reoccurring theme whenever we talk with the Kansas Farm Service Agency employees that going and talking to your local office is really important for learning more information and figuring out how Kansas FSA could help them. Very, very much. Any final thoughts that you want producers to remember when talking about this Farm Storage Facility Loan Program? One key thing that uh, we haven't brought up yet is that I want all potential applicants to keep in mind that FSFL loans must be approved before you start any site preparation or, and or construction. All loans are subject to an environmental evaluation. And if you accept delivery of equipment or start any site prep or construction before the loan is approved, that may impede the environmental evaluation, which may adversely affect your loan eligibility. But once again, with that in mind, we recommend that anyone interested in this program contact FSA early in the planning stages. That will help us ensure that all environmental regulations are followed and also will give us a chance to help the producers with the application process. If producers are interested in this, and don't start. Wait till you get all of your ducks in a row before maybe breaking ground on that new facility. Yes. Um, yeah. Don't move any dirt. Don't clear any trees. Make sure you check with FSA first talked a lot about this farm storage facility loan program. However, you wanted to make a quick note on a discrimination financial assistance program. I do. It's in regards to the farm loan program. 
Section 22007 of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is known as IRA, provides assistance for USDA farm loan borrowers who have faced discrimination by USDA in farm lending prior to 2021. For questions, we suggest individuals visit 22007apply.gov or call 1-800-721-0970. It is important to note that your local FSA office does not take the applications. However, we're just providing the outreach to the public. You can apply online, via email, or at a regional office. Please know that USDA has contracted with several nonprofit cooperators to provide this service for free. Again, for more information, please visit 22007apply.gov. And once again, that's one web address, but for Farm Service Agency loans, what website should they visit for that? For information about FSA programs, be it farm programs or farm loans, we always suggest producers visit www.farmers.gov. Kim, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us some more information about another Kansas FSA program. Thank you so much. That was Kansas FSA Regional Farm Loan Specialist Kim Cherney. The phone number that she mentioned in regards to Section 22007 of the Inflation Reduction Act is 800-721-0970. Again, that's 800-721-0970. Or you can find more information by visiting 22007apply.gov. And as always, you can find the information for Kansas FSA programs by going to farmers.gov. All of these will be linked in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned into Agriculture Today, and we continue our show now discussing some upcoming meetings that will be covering canola. And then to talk about them, we have K-State canola breeder Mike Stom and producer origination manager with Schooler Jordan Flynn. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's good to be here, Shelby. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Shelby. I'm happy for the opportunity. Mike, getting started with you here, discussing these meetings, how are they getting put on and why are we having them? Well, uh, Shelby, it, it really is a result of the announcement from Schooler here recently that they'll be recommissioning the Goodland Canola Crush Facility. And so as those that are uh, aware of con- the canola industry, Schooler stepped in and made this decision uh, to reopen this plant. And that has certainly generated some uh, renewed interest in canola as an alternative crop in, in Kansas. And so it's the right opportunity to put on these these meetings uh, because here we are uh, about the, the 1st of August and it's canola planting season that really starts in the state of Kansas about September 1st and runs through the entire month as you move from uh, north to south in the state. And so it's important that we get uh, producers the information they need to be successful growing the crop. And so it, it's really the a critical time and the right time uh, to put on these schools. And there's really a team coming together to help put on these schools, correct? That's right. Yeah, the uh, the meetings are being uh, sponsored by uh, the Great Plains Canola Association, Schooler, uh, Kansas State University, as well as Bear Crop Science. And all of these uh, entities are, are going to be key stakeholders with the canola industry here in the, the Central Plains moving forward. Obviously, a lot of people coming together here. And Jordan, Mike, what topics are going to be covered at this meetings? From the schooler side, we're going to be talking about the purchasing of, of the canola directly from producers. You know, a schooler, we're, we're a 130-year-old company, uh, very established, um, and have a network of cross-country traders and then our own facilities across different geographies where we have purchased grain directly from producers and also from third-party facilities. So we will be talking about the the purchasing um, and all of the different pieces that go into that, um, act of God con- clauses, discount schedules, things like that, everything that a producer would need to know from the purchasing side. Um, and it, it's really funny, actually. I was uh, kind of talking to a couple of my colleagues about, you know, why the partnership with K-State for these meetings. Like, how did that begin? Um, and Ed Prosser said, you know, when you, when you think about agriculture in the state of Kansas, you always end up in Manhattan, right? So... Uh, it, it was just kind of funny to hear Ed say that. Um, and obviously, uh, Mike is a wealth of knowledge on the ag- agronomy side. 
So I, I've loved that partnership and to be able to utilize his expertise in that, that umbrella. And Mike, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so uh, Kansas State and Oklahoma State actually play a role in, in bringing the agronomic information that growers need to grow uh, winter canola successfully uh, to the table. And so uh, I'll be on the speaking agenda as well. And uh, of course, my uh, my role to play here is is talking about variety development, it's something that I've been doing for some uh, time now. And so, you know, even when our, our market was kind of struggling here with canola in the Central Plains, the breeding program uh, continued on at Kansas State. And so we have developed some new uh, winter canola varieties that we'll be uh, talking about that bring uh, important traits to the table. Uh, we'll also be talking about some of the new technologies that we foresee here in the next two to three years becoming available to growers. Uh, some technologies like you know, pod shatter resistance that producers have never really had an opportunity to uh, utilize in the canola varieties they've grown here in the region. And so some exciting news uh, potentially to share there. And then uh, we will have uh, an Oklahoma State agronomist, Josh Bashong, who's also been involved with uh, canola extension and research, uh, speaking at these meetings. And he has a wealth of knowledge on basically the how to grow uh, canola. And so it's going to be kind of a, a trip uh, back to the basics and, and kind of with this reinvigoration of interest, uh, we also need to be reminded of those steps that we need to take, again, to be successful growing the crop. And so uh, lots of planning considerations uh, to discuss, you know, uh, site preparation, uh, which sites to pick, you know, what's our fertility level, what do our fertility levels need to be, uh, seeding practices, planning dates, you know, seeding depth. You know, any of those topics are going to be for discussion at these meetings. And so, again, really excited to partner with Schooler because uh, they are definitely the ones that have have generated the buzz around canola again. And so uh, we enjoy uh, being a part of the partnership that's going to help the growers to, to be successful growing this crop again. Is it fair to say then kind of covering topics all the way from what seed to pick to how do I sell it once it's grown and ready to leave my field and property? Yeah, that's right. That that really covers it from the very beginning to the, the end of the, the season. For people who are considering, you know, I haven't really seen canola, haven't really even thought about growing it. Why should they maybe consider it? Well, those that have grown the crop uh, can speak uh, to this based on their, their experiences, but you know, what we've seen uh, with canola in rotation with wheat in, in our region is they're truly beneficial crops to each other. And we've seen a tremendous yield improvement and quality improvement in wheat when we rotate canola into a, a wheat-heavy uh, cropping system in our region. So, again, canola is a winter crop. It's a broadleaf crop, so you have a different class of herbicides that you can use to control, you know, the grassy wheat species that are a problem in wheat production in our region. You know, and that's really, first and foremost, that's that's the main reason to grow winter canola in our region. But it's also, a, again, a high value crop. It's an oil seed. Uh, it's going to be priced similarly to, to soybean. And so we really think that's going to drive some value uh, with growing this crop in our region. And so, Jordan, as we've talked about these meetings and kind of what's going to be covered here, why do you think producers should attend if they're even thinking about canola? Well, as Mike kind of stated, I mean, there's going to be uh, a lot of information all the way from seed selection to marketing opportunities. And, and right now, I feel like producers really need to look for different opportunities to diversify their operation um, and make sure to do things to ensure profitability long term. Um, and we as Schooler really believe that um, adding canola into the cropping rotation is a way to accomplish that. That's why we've invested in the plant. Um, that is why we are out actively bidding currently for canola already, um, giving guys the assurance that we are going to be here not only this year, but years into the future. Uh, we made a, a very large investment um, in the plant. So um, we hope that people understand that that is showing everyone that that schooler will be here for many years to come on the canola side so you know whether whether you've planted it or not in the past i think the the meeting will bring a a wealth of knowledge um, and maybe a new revenue stream for for producers in the great plains area 
And Mike, when people walk away from hopefully coming and attending the meetings, which we'll touch on those details here just shortly, what do you hope they walk away with? Really, I hope they walk away with uh, wanting to put this crop back in their rotation. And I think they'll have the tools to do that. You know, it, we just feel that, again, the the benefit that canola brings to a cereal heavy rotation in our region uh, really speaks for uh, itself. We've seen the benefits of that. Um, and as Jordan men- mentioned, uh, that crop diversification piece is really important. As we've seen over the years with the weather that we have uh, in, in the Southern Plains, it's it's really important to grow uh, multiple crops. And we feel like this one can could be that, that additional crop that will help producers be profitable. And what are the details of these upcoming meetings? And do people need an RSVP before attending? Yeah, it would be important to RSVP because we will have uh, meals at both of these meetings. Uh, the first meeting on, on August 9th, Wednesday, is at 10 a.m. at the Hoover Building in uh, in Enid, Oklahoma. And probably the best way to uh, RSVP for this meeting is to send uh, Josh Bashong an email. Uh, Josh's email is josh.busong at okstate.edu. And then the second meeting will be at 5.30 at the Sedgwick County Extension Office. And I would say the best way for producers to RSVP to that meeting would be uh, just to call the the extension office there in Wichita. And is this free for producers to attend? Yeah, absolutely. Mike, Jordan, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and giving us some information on these upcoming canola meetings that producers that are currently producing canola or may want to be in the future are welcome to attend. I appreciate it. Thank you, Shelby. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Shelby. That was Kansas State University canola breeder Mike Stom, and he was joined by producer origination manager with schooler Jordan Flynn. The meetings that we talked about in today's show are both taking place Wednesday, August 9th. The first one is taking place in Enid, Oklahoma, in the Hoover Building. That meeting starts at 10 a.m. and will have presentations and a meal. The second one that day is then taking place in Wichita, Kansas, in the Sunflower Room at the Sedgwick County Extension Office. That meeting starts at 5.30 p.m. and has presentations and a meal as well. Registration for this event is required. However, the meetings are free to attend and the meal will be provided. I will link a news release that discusses these two meetings a bit more in depth and has the information on how to RSVP in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but when we come back, we'll be joined by K-State's Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. This week's experts, Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Dustin Pendle, discuss different calving seasons for operations. We continue our show now with K-State's Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. Hi, welcome to BCI Ask the Experts, where our experts will answer your questions. And I'm joined by two great experts today, Dr. Brian Lubbers and Dr. Dustin Pendle. And each of them, as they answer, will get up to 10 points for their answers. Today's question is on the timing of calving season and when should I have my calving season. Dustin, I'm going to go to you first. Yeah, so that's uh, it's a great question. I think there's probably a lot of different points that we could pick on. I'm just going to pick three, and that's going to be the economic components. Uh, number one, cattle prices. I think that's going to have – when are you going to market your calves? Prices are a little going to be higher in the spring. So if you think about fall-born versus spring-born calves, feed prices, so seasonality feed prices as well. If you got to keep the calves over the winter – cows you know with the milk and whatnot so that's higher prices so that's another thing so you got the feed prices you get the cattle prices and then finally let's say availability of labor are you a crop producer as well because if you're talking fall if you're trying to wean or or calve in the fall if you're harvesting your crop so labor availability as well is going to be a my third point so three big things to consider there when you're thinking about calving time related to feed prices cattle prices and availability of labor dustin starts out with six points brian so, you know, and there are people that make spring calving herds work. There are make people that make fall calving herds work. There are people that make both work at the same time. And I like Dustin's approach, you know, there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong answer. And so things that you think about, so, and I'm going to kind of lean more towards spring as my answer, because one of the things that we have the advantage in spring is, 
is we're able to better match up the nutritional needs of that lactating cow or maybe early weaned calf with forage availability, right? That's that's kind of the strong argument for springborn. However, I also think I maybe would move it traditionally, you know, if we're an early, early spring, like that January, February, there may be some advantages to pushing back just a little bit because of some of the health implications of that, especially if you live in those colder climates, those calves that are born in that weather, you know, sometimes they struggle to get out of the gate well. And so I think even pushing it back and quite honestly, it makes it a little easier on yourself as a producer. You don't have to be out in the cold and the dark all the time to help calves be born. I'm going to give Brian seven points. He had six points, but then he defined January and February as spring, just like most of our cow <laughs> calf people do. So he gets a bonus point yeah. for that, for just ignoring the calendar. So Dustin, as you think about, you talked about high cattle prices and high feed prices. Those are in juxtaposition. So when we have spring calving herds, I'm taking advantage of some of the things Brian mentioned. When I have a fall calving herd, I'm taking advantage of some of those cattle prices. How do I balance those two or figure out the optimum? So, yeah, that's a great question. Function of it could be where you live, right? So if you're maybe in a little warmer climate where you can keep your cattle out maybe on grass a little longer, you know, if you have the fall-born calves selling the spring higher prices, maybe your feed expenses over winter are going to be a little less. If you don't have the feed, if it's a lot cooler, you got to feed hay more frequently early on. That could tip it to maybe more of a spring. If you are a grain farmer, right, if you're harvesting corn, beans during the winter. So where I grew up in Illinois, your, your primary is crop where you might have a small uh, herd. You're probably not going to have a lot of availability of labor in the fall because you're out in combine corn, beans. So that might drive a lot of it as well for some people. So it, it's hard to say specifically, but it's probably a function of where you are and what your other operations. Where you are, and you're, and you're right, you brought up your third point is – don't forget about that labor because it, my best laid plans, if I can't execute them by having the labor there at the time I need it, are going to be a problem. Brian, you mentioned you're leaning towards spring, but you talked about the potential for a spring and fall herd. What would be an advantage of having a dual herd? You know, the dual herd thing really only works you got multiple pastures to manage animals. And so, you know, the advantage is, is you get that blend of, you get the economic advantage of being able to market calves at the right time, but you, with your spring herd, then you've got the advantage of taking advantage of those forage resources. So it's kind of the, the hybrid of the two, right? And it really has a lot based in economics. Thanks guys. Great answers today on the question. Looks like it depends on your situation. Dustin ended up with nine. Brian ended up with eight. Thanks for listening. If you have questions for us, you can send them to bci at ksu.edu. Once again, that was K-State's Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts, Brad White, Brian Lubers, and Dustin Pindle. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Mm-hmm.